Should have tried that. <laughs> Had to do it. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome. If you're new here among us, I'm crazy. <laughs> My name is Gene. I serve here at C3 Church as your lead pastor. As a kid, did you ever make shadow puppets? You ever do that? I think everybody does. Are you still a kid like me? <laughs> I like shadow puppets. I heard a story of a little boy, a sad tale actually, he became an orphan. His parents passed away, he had no grandparents living, no aunts or uncles, so he ended up at an orphanage, pretty sad. He was depressed, he wouldn't play with the other kids, sometimes he wouldn't even eat. There was also a night watchman at this orphanage kind of like Night at the Museum that we watched, right? You're watching part two soon, the seventh, movie day, kind of like that. And he would come early before his shift, before the kids went to bed, he'd give them gifts, especially during Christmas time. He was Santa Claus and bring the kids toys. But no matter what he brought to this little boy, he wasn't happy. Nothing seemed to make him happy. He had trouble sleeping, and one night, he noticed the night watchman pass by his room with a flashlight. He said, wait. So the man came in, and he asked for the flashlight. So he grabbed the flashlight. The man noticed that the little boy seemed entertained for once, kind of happy. So the watchman pointed the flashlight at the wall. He made some shadow puppets for the little boy. The boy smiled, fascinating. So the watchman let the boy keep the flashlight, made him happy. But this kind of turned the other way. Now all the boy wanted to do was play with the flashlight and make shadow puppets. So during the daytime, he kept the curtains closed. He's in the dark all the time with this artificial light making shadow puppets. He wouldn't go outside and play with the other kids at all now. Sometimes he would skip meals, even if they brought it into his room. They became concerned about him, so they brought a doctor in. The doctor came in and watched the boy. He observed him for a little while. And after a bit, he walked over to the boy, and he took the flashlight away. Well, as you can imagine, the boy was pretty upset. Favorite toy. He started crying. Then the crying turned into screaming, but the doctor knew. Let him cry it out, but he kept going. So the doctor walked up to the window and flung the curtains open. Now all of a sudden, a flood of light, like a hundred flashlights, came into the room and the boy stopped crying. Then the doctor walked up to the window and flung that open too, and all of a sudden, the sounds of birds chirping and dogs barking also flooded the room. 
You see, all of the better realities of the things the boy was trying to recreate were there the whole time, ignored by the focus on the shadow of them. Today, we find ourselves in Genesis chapter 10, where we're looking at the rest of the story. And we're going to address the reason for suffering, that is, the biblical reason for suffering. A pertinent topic today is many navigate loss of property, income, sickness. We'll be looking at the book of Job today. And some might wonder why we're doing that so early. Glad you asked. <laughs> the Bible, as I've told you in the past, is not chronological. The books are grouped according to categories. So you have the Old Testament, you have Genesis through Deuteronomy. These are the books of the law or the Torah, the teachings. Then you have historical books, Joshua through Esther. Then you have the poetry books or the writings, Job through Song of Songs or Song of Solomon. So you got your Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes in between. Then you have your prophets, your prophetic books, Isaiah all the way to Malachi. Then you have the New Testament, begins with the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. They are biographies about the life and ministry of Jesus Christ. Acts is a history of the early church. And then you have letters to certain people and certain churches. And then you have Revelation, which at first is kind of like some letters, and then a prophetic book about the second coming of Jesus. Now, in this series, we're going to be placing the books in their chronological order. This can be very difficult to do. You kind of got to be good at names. So we're putting the books back in their order in this series. Last week, we looked at Noah. At the Bible study, we took a closer look at his three sons that go on to populate the world, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Genesis 10, where we're arriving today, says this, 1032. These are the clans that descended from Noah's sons, arranged by nation according to their lines of descent. All the nations of the earth descended from these clans after the great flood. Now, when we get to Shem, this is the line that the Israelites will come from, and then subsequently Jesus. In it, this section, Genesis 10, we see a guy named Jobab. Many people think that this is Job, but it's even more likely that it's the Jobab that appears a little later in Genesis 36. But placing Job there will interrupt a flow, as we'll see, but I'll explain later why Genesis 36 is a better choice. The story of Job finds appropriate placement here after Cain and Abel. Seth and Noah, where there's this theme of suffering leading to new life or new beginnings. There's also a theme of humility that sets us up for next week when we look at the Tower of Babel. So here's the story of Job. I'm going to kind of paraphrase it for you so we can get through it, and I'll point out some of the details here. The story of Job begins with Job. He's a man from Uz, not Oz, from Uz. That's kind of funny, but whatever. <laughs> He's a really wealthy guy, wealthiest guy in the whole area. He has tons of livestock, tons and tons of animals, 7,000 sheep, so on and so forth. He has children, seven sons, three daughters. Pretty blessed man. He's a righteous guy. His kids, though, like to party a little too much, so Job prays for them. In fact, he makes sacrifices for his children. Thoughtful. He's worried that they might have cursed God in their hearts. Pay attention to that. Then it moves to what I like to think of or visualize. When you read, you usually come up with visuals, right? Like a throne room scene. We're in the heavenly realms with God, and Satan, the accuser, comes in. God says something funny. He does this to Adam and Eve. What you been doing? Like he doesn't know 
Well, Satan answers him, well, I've been patrolling or roaming the earth. God says, well, while you were doing that, did you notice my man Job? Starts bragging about Job. Don't you hate when people do that? And you're like, no, 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 no. Starts bragging about him. And he says, well, Job, he's blameless. A man of complete integrity. Satan says, yeah, he's like that because you've built a wall of protection, a hedge of protection around him, him and his stuff. If you take that away, he'll curse you to your face. God says, okay, test him. So, flashes to Job. He's in his house. His kids are in their house partying, doing their thing. A messenger comes in. Job, the Sabian raiders came through. They took your oxen and your donkeys, killed all the servants too. I'm the only one left. Before that messenger can finish up, another one comes in. Job, the fire of God has come down from heaven, burned up your sheep. They're not going to do it for me. They make good sheep noises. 7,000 of them. That would have been good, guys. Come on. You to back me up here. <laughs> Before he can finish, another messenger comes in. This time it's the Chaldeans. Three bands of them. They came and they took more animals, your camels, in fact. And then, before he can finish, another messenger comes in. Worst thing of all, a whirlwind came through, blew down your house, killed all your kids. What does Job do? He worships. So now we go back to the throne room scene. And it's almost exactly the same wording. God's there. Satan, the accuser, comes in. Another rhetorical question. Where have you been? I've been out patrolling the earth. Did you notice my man Job? He's blameless, a man of complete integrity. In fact, didn't curse me when you tested him. Satan says, skin for skin. It's because you didn't let me harm him physically. That was the stipulation in the first one, if I forgot it. Don't harm him physically. This time... If we do that, then he's going to curse you to your face. God says, test him. So, it flashes to Job. Now he's got all these nasty boils. He's scraping them with a piece of pottery, like a broken plate. His wife's there. If you're paying close attention to the store, you might wonder, why did Satan let him keep his wife? I'm going to stop there and just give you the facts of the story. <laughs> stop. Get behind me, Satan. <laughs> she says, why don't you curse God and die? That's why. That was the objective, right? Are you paying attention? Why don't you curse God now? She's working for Satan. Then his friends come along. Eliphaz, Zophar, and Bildad. And at first, they're really good friends to Job. They don't say anything. At first, they sit there with him and they mourn with him for like a week. But then, it goes to kind of like this courtroom scene, where now his three friends become like these attorneys. It's kind of how I picture it in my mind, a courtroom, where Job is kind of left there without even the public defender to defend himself against these three attorney-ish-like friends who are now playing the role of the accusers, Satan, that's what it means. And they take their turns accusing him. The main accusation is that, Job, you sinned. You must have sinned, and that's what happened. That's the main one, there are other things. And then there's these cycles. Job gives like nine defensive speeches defending himself. I didn't sin is the basic thing he's saying over and over again. This is the bulk of the book of Job. That's really what happens. But then, Elihu shows up on the scene. He's an interesting character. It's another little uh, prefigure of John the Baptist, if you read it carefully and you're paying attention. He kind of paves the way. Remember it said that John the Baptist is a messenger, paving the way for the Lord. God's about to show up. So if you know the story, you go back and read it again, knowing this, you see that more clearly. Paves the way, then God shows up. 
and whirlwind. Job 38. It's my favorite because God takes this sarcastic type position. He says, Job, and I'm paraphrasing, put on your big boy pants. Gird your loins, literally. Put on your big boy pants because you've got to answer some questions. Here's the deal. Where were you when I made the whole world? Tell me if you know. Where were you when I took the measurements for the earth? So it's this very kind of funny language that should bring up some ironic imagery. It's not possible. It's all tape measure or something like that. It's humorous. But he's mocking Job. Interesting. Then, <laughs> go pray for your friends. I don't even want to hear them right now. So Job, you go pray for them. Then, he's healed. And his fortune is doubled. Woo! Gets twice the amount of sheep. Now he's 14,000 sheep. He lives a long time, another 140 or 170 years. So he's like 240-something. It depends on the version. We'll get there by the end of this message. It varies a little bit. He lives a long time, past 120 years, if you were at Bible study. He lives for a while. Now, this is usually where the story kind of stops. In fact, most people stop at the fortunes doubled. Been in church for a long time, isn't that what people hang on, right? Ah, but he got twice as much back for his suffering. That's cool. Well, hang on that. And they miss the point. No matter what happens to Job, he recognized God as sovereign. The first time he does this, this is his reaction to just losing everything, except the wife. Okay. Job 1.20, Job stood up and tore his robe in grief, and he shaved his head and fell to the ground to worship. He said, I came naked from my mother's womb, and I'll be naked when I leave. The Lord gave me what I had, and the Lord has taken it away. Praise the name of the Lord. In all of this, Job did not sin by blaming God. In fact, his response was worship. No wife jokes. It's all about God's sovereignty, a theme. This all comes from God, regardless of what the tool is inflicting it. It's all with God's permission. Nothing happens outside of that. So, many ask the question, why? Why suffering? Well, there's another reason why we're placing Job here in proximity. Because our answer came right away at the very beginning of the story. Remember Adam and Eve. They sinned, and what happens? Adam now has to toil to get things to grow out of the soil. Eve, she's now going to experience suffering in childbirth. But there's a little more to it. And on the more to it, I hear a lot of opinions. And if you've been around for a while, you guys know how I feel about the opinions of man versus the Word of God. I don't like it. <laughs> Again, recently, I've been asked the question, who I'm reading? I love when people do that because it gives me the opportunity to answer with God. I'm reading God. It was great because this time the guy was kind of smart. Not smart enough not to ask that question, but smart enough not to say anything after I said, I'm reading God. <laughs> he laughed. Checkmate. Because what is he going to say? Yeah, that's great, Gene. I know you're reading the Bible and everything like that, but why don't you read this book by some guy and all his opinions on what God says? Well, thanks. I'll stick with the Bible. The more in the Word I am, the less I like man's opinion about it. If you're in the Word a lot, it does a good job of translating itself for you. So that's what we're going to do today. We're going to look at a lot of scriptures. We're going to look at this Old Testament book through the lens of the New. You can view the New Testament as a commentary on the Old. 
skip some of the other commentaries. So let's see what God says about suffering. Here's what Jesus says about it. John chapter 9. Very interesting little parallel to Job here. Jesus and his disciples run across a man blind, born blind, it tells us. His disciples act just like Job's friends. What did he do to deserve this? Or what did his parents do? Who sinned? Somebody must have sinned for this guy to be born blind. Here's what Jesus says. God gives us the answer. It was not because of his sins or his parents' sins, Jesus answered. This happened so the power of God could be seen in him. Ah, Jesus heals him. He's the light of men. It's all about God and his glory, not ours. We mustn't miss that point. As I said earlier, many of these New Testament books, they're letters. And many of them are written by someone who has experienced suffering, sometimes a great deal of suffering. They're also letters called prison epistles because they're written by Paul while he's in prison, where he's suffering. We'll look at Philippians in particular today, one of these prison epistles. There are some in which people are experiencing sickness. Galatians, Paul writes that that's the occasion. That's why he arrives in Galatia. He gets sick. He has to stop there. In 1 Timothy, Paul offers a suggestion to remedy Timothy's frequent stomach illnesses. Surprisingly, it isn't prayer. It's medicinal. 2 Timothy, another letter written by Paul while he's in prison. Furthermore, this time, he's convinced that he's about to die. He's about to get executed. In it, Paul prepares Timothy for anticipated and further suffering, saying this, So never be ashamed to tell others about our Lord, and don't be ashamed of me either, even though I'm in prison for him, Jesus. With the strength God gives you, be ready to suffer with me for the sake of the good news. And he continues to say, you know how much persecution and suffering I have endured. You know all about how I was persecuted in Antioch, Iconium, and Lystra, but the Lord rescued me from all of it. Yes, and everyone, not just someone, and everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. The Bible also tells us that God is our Father, and as such, He disciplines us. The New Testament teaches that if God is that superior Father, well, that's going to include discipline. That's what a good Father does, doesn't spoil His children. Now, there's a context here, but we are in our series in the book of Hebrews, and we talked about that. It's probably like a sermon or something being preached. In it, we learn this from chapter 10. We get the context of suffering. They're Jewish Christians, and they're tempted to go back to Judaism, give up Jesus. So the whole theme of the whole thing is that Jesus is superior to all of these different things in that old religious system. He's better. But preacher is going to address the suffering, and he likes it to discipline. In fact, not even going to read you the really tough verses, he says he punishes his children. The word there in Greek is the same for the flogging that Jesus gets before the cross. It's pretty serious. He goes on to say, Hebrews 12, 7, as you endure this divine discipline, remember that God is treating you as his own children. Who ever heard of a child who is never disciplined by its father? And if God doesn't discipline you as he does all his children, it means that you are illegitimate and not really his children at all. Since we respected our earthly fathers who disciplined us, shouldn't we submit even more to the discipline of the father of our spirits and live forever? 
as children, we're children of the greatest father ever. We are not undisciplined, spoiled children. If we are, then we're illegitimate. Maybe tough to hear, but that's God's word, not mine. Our Father does bless us. Hear me now. Our Father does bless us at His choosing, but our Father does not spoil us with those blessings, especially with the things of the world. Let's look at the full counsel of God's Word on that to be clear. 1 John 2, starting at verse 15, do not love this world nor the things it offers you. For when you love the world, you do not have the love of the Father in you. For the world offers only a craving for physical pleasure, a craving for everything we see, and pride in our achievements and possessions. These are not from the Father, but are from this world. And this world is fading away, along with everything that people crave. But anyone who does what pleases God will live forever. Suffering has its purposes. God, as our Father, uses suffering in different forms for different purposes. As a pastor, I've noticed something. It's very rare to meet a new person on Sunday who's come in with a winning lottery ticket. I don't get that very much. Hi, nice to meet you. Pastor, I can't wait to praise God for this winning lottery ticket and give the church 10%. <laughs> Maybe it'll happen today. <laughs> that would be great. Doesn't happen often. You see, it's often suffering that most effectively drives us to our knees or to church. What do we do when we get the winning lottery? Lotto ticket, right? We forget about God sometimes, and we go get all the things that this world has to offer. Suffering tests our faith. Job 23, 10. But God knows where I am going, and he tests me. I will come out as pure as gold. The New Testament affirms this. First and Second Peter are very interesting letters. Give them a read. More so in Second Peter, the context here is that the Roman Emperor Nero, he's really mean to Christians. He begins burning them alive. So when you read First and Second Peter, you kind of have to have this in your mind that these Christians are suffering greatly. Peter's trying to encourage the church, don't fall away. He says this, 1 Peter 1, starting at verse 6, So be truly glad. There's wonderful joy ahead, even though you must endure many trials for a little while. These trials will show that your faith is genuine. It is being tested as fire tests and purifies gold, though your faith is far more precious than mere gold. So when your faith remains strong through many trials, it will bring you much praise and glory and honor on the day when Jesus Christ is revealed. To the whole world. Suffering reminds us that our citizenship is not here. Peter calls us aliens, sojourners. We're just passing through. That's how we must think. So if we look at Philippians, this is my favorite book or letter of the Bible. I just love it. I love it mostly because of that Carmen Christie poem that I recite to you guys all the time. It tells us about the nature of Jesus Christ and what he did. It's beautiful. If I could just tear one page out of the Bible, if that's all I could have, that would be the page. It tells us everything we need to know right there. But there's a context. Paul is suffering in prison. So the Philippians, they're very generous. They send him a gift with Epaphroditus, <laughs> who gets so sick, he almost dies. But he gets well enough thank goodness, to take this letter back. It's a really beautiful thank you note with a lot of great theology in it. In it, Paul is kind of funny. He says some really surprising things. If you're reading it and thinking about what he's actually saying, he says, I'm really grateful to be here in prison because 
the whole Roman guards hearing the gospel. Isn't that great? What a wonderful opportunity this is. And you know what? Now that everybody's hearing it, it would be so much better for me to just die so I can go home and be with the Lord. That's gain to me. But for your sake, well, I'll live on so I can help you out. <laughs> we don't think like that, do we? In that context, he says this, Above all, you must live as citizens of heaven, conducting yourselves in a manner worthy of the good news about Christ. Then, whether I come and see you again or only hear about you, I will know that you are standing together with one spirit and one purpose, fighting together for the faith, which is the good news. If we jump back to Hebrews and keep reading, it says, For this world is not our permanent home. We are looking forward to a home yet to come. Suffering builds our character. Paul writes this to the church in Rome. We can rejoice, too, when we run into problems and trials. For we know that they help us develop endurance. And endurance develops strength of character. And character strengthens our confident hope of salvation. And this hope will not lead to disappointment, for we know how dearly God loves us, because He has given us the Holy Spirit to fill our hearts with His love. Suffering leads to humility. That's what Job says. So who am I that I should try to answer God or even reason with Him? He'll forget that a little bit, but God reminds him. The New Testament affirms this. Second Corinthians, Paul's writing. He's got all these revelations from God, interesting letter. He's dealing with a couple of different things. The church in Corinth is dragging their feet on a collection. He actually uses the churches in Macedonia. That would be Philippi to kind of like prod them along. They're being really generous. Why don't you pick up the pace on this collection for Jerusalem? The other thing he's dealing with is the super apostles, these false teachers, always a theme in these New Testament letters. Some books are entirely about it, like Jude. He's getting annoyed, so he has to kind of like talk himself up a little bit. So he talks about these revelations that he has. But he balances it out. 2 Corinthians 12, 7, Even though I have received such wonderful revelations from God, so to keep me from becoming proud, I was given a thorn in my flesh, a messenger from Satan to torment me and to keep me from becoming proud. Sounds like Job a little bit. And Paul questions it too. He continues, three different times I begged the Lord to take it away. It's thorn in the flesh. Each time he said, my grace is all you need. My grace is sufficient for you. My power works best in weakness, yours. So now I am glad to boast about my weakness so that the power of Christ can work through me. That's why I take pleasure in my weaknesses and in the insults, hardships, persecutions, and troubles that I suffer for Christ. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Again, it's about God's glory, not ours. And as such, suffering makes us more like Jesus. What are Jesus' requirements for following him? Deny yourself. It's a tall order. Pick up your cross, then follow me. Remember Peter. This is what he continues to write. 1 Peter 2, 21, For God called you to do good, even if it means suffering, just as Christ suffered for you. He is your example, and you must follow in his steps. He continues, Dear friends, don't be surprised at the fiery trials you are going through, as if something strange were happening to you. Instead, be very glad, for these trials make you partners with Christ in his suffering, so that you will have the wonderful joy of seeing his glory when it is revealed to all the world. Peter's pretty interesting. Seems like in the Gospels, Peter doesn't get it, like the get behind me Satan thing. That's where that comes from. But as we read about him in the book of Acts, 
He does some interesting stuff. And one of that stuff's <laughs> is they're told not to preach the gospel. They're in the temple preaching the gospel. And the Jewish leadership doesn't like it. They don't want to hear this new Jewish sect of the Nazarenes. This is these Jesus believers. Right? So they're Jewish. They're very much a Jewish, and it's just another Jewish sect. But they're causing problems for them. They're saying things like, you killed the author of life. So they arrest them, Peter and the apostles. But then an angel breaks them out of prison, and they go right back to the temple and continue preaching the gospel. They look for him. They can't find him. And they're like, they're in the temple. Okay. So they arrest him again, and they bring them before the high council. The high council wants to kill them. Stop it. No, we can't. We have to do what God says. Okay, you die. Then Gamaliel, or Gamaliel, <laughs> he's actually, you find this out later, Paul's teacher. Paul learned at his feet, he says. Smart guy. He goes on to say, mm, hold on a second. If it's some kind of rebellion like the past ones, they'll be found out. They'll be crushed. But if these guys are from God, we're going to find ourselves fighting against God. So they're like, Okay, let's not kill them. But we're going to flog them real good first and then send them on their way. And that's what they do. They whip them. Very brutal. This is their reaction. As the apostles left the high council, rejoicing that God had counted them worthy to suffer disgrace and this flogging for the name of Jesus. <laughs> and every day in the temple and from house to house, they continued to teach and preach this message, Jesus is the Messiah. Didn't slow him down. If we go back to Philippians, for you have been given not only the privilege of trusting in Christ, but also the privilege of suffering for him. Mm. Now, like some pastors today, you try to brush aside these realities, this suffering. Let's not talk about that. But these are truths from the Bible, they often try to replace these truths with opinions about it or deny the reality of suffering altogether. Now, Job's friends don't necessarily go that far, but they have a lot of opinions about Job's suffering. And Sometimes they may have some good points mixed in. But while they're trying to press their opinions so pridefully, they miss the point. Again, we saw the point, God's sovereignty and glory, not ours. And as it pertains to us, Job says this, Job 34, starting at verse 14, if God were to take back his spirit and withdraw his breath, all life would cease, and humanity would turn again to dust. Now, with the way we're arranging these books, this should make you think of Adam. From dust he came, and to dust he returned. God breathed life into him. When we get to Abel, what did that mean? Breath, symbolizing his very life. It was just a breath. That's it. And so are our days, just like breath. I've showed you that biblical truth. No matter how much Job got back, none of it belonged to him anyway. We can't take it with us. Here's what the New Testament says about Job in particular. James 5, starting at verse 7. Dear brothers and sisters, be patient as you wait for the Lord's return. Consider the farmers who patiently wait for the rains and the fall and in the spring. They eagerly look for the valuable harvest to ripen. You too must be patient. Take courage, for the coming of the Lord is near. Don't grumble about each other, brothers and sisters, or you will be judged. For look, the judge is standing at the door. He sounds like his brother Jesus. For examples of patience and suffering, dear brothers and sisters, look at the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. 
We give great honor to those who endure under suffering. For instance, you know about Job, a man of great endurance. You can see how the Lord was kind to him at the end. For the Lord is full of tenderness and mercy. See what the New Testament does with Job? Connects that kindness to Christ. That is the context there. Christ is the context, his coming, his second coming. And Christ says this, John 16, 33, I have told you all this so that you may have peace in me. Here on earth you will have many trials and sorrows, but take heart because I have overcome the world. How did Jesus overcome the world? He conquered death itself through the resurrection. Back to Philippians 3.10. Paul writes, I want to know Christ and experience the mighty power that raised him from the dead. I want to suffer with him, sharing in his death, so that one way or another, I will experience the resurrection from the dead. Paul places all of his hope right there on the resurrection. And so should we. Now, it seems as if Job might have hope in the same thing, curiously. Job 19.25, but as for me, I know that my Redeemer lives, and he will stand upon the earth at last. After my body has decayed, yet in my body I will see God. Or some versions say, without my body, I will see God. But the book of Job then ends with him dying. That's it. That is, in most modern versions of the Bible. But in the Bible of the early church, the ones the apostles were reading, the story of Job ends differently. There are some verses, as we'll see throughout this series, that have been redacted from many modern Bibles. So here's a very important part of the rest of the story. Now you can go back and watch it if you're new here today. It's important to mention this here. You can watch the Bible studies or the first part of the series, the intro, it was necessary because I told you that the Old Testament, the scriptures of the early church were all in Greek. It was a Greek-speaking world. They're writing the New Testament in Greek, and they're quoting the Greek version. If you've been around for a while, you probably notice that when they quote something in the Old Testament, it doesn't often match perfectly. It's because they're quoting the Greek version, not the Hebrew version, which, as I told you, was written hundreds of years after Jesus. So many Bible translations will make notes, LXX, 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 where it's different. Right. A lot of the prophecies aren't there either in the Hebrew version later. So when we're looking at the Greek version, written a couple hundred years before Jesus, we see different things. The early church felt that it was a superior translation that pointed to Christ. And I showed you a whole bunch of quotes ad nauseum. <laughs> by early church fathers, because a lot of people don't believe or get this, affirming that, that this is the superior Holy Spirit version we should be using. And the Greek version, that one, does not end with Job dying. It gives us some other information. Here's some of that info. Now, these were the kings who reigned in Edom, over which country he also ruled. First, there was Balak, the son of Beor. Hmm, some of you know who he is. And the name of his city was Denebah. But after Balak, there was Jobab, who was called Job. Interesting. That's why Genesis 36 is a better technical placement. You can pick up those books. That's where you'll see pretty good translations of them. The Orthodox Study Bible uses the Septuagint, the Greek version, exclusively for their Old Testament. They've stayed right on that line throughout history without changing. They were against changing to the Hebrew later. 
Now, it also says this about Job. It is written that he, Job, will rise with the ones the Lord resurrects. Ah, we see a resurrection from the dead in the Old Testament, like the end of Daniel. But it's also here in Job, too. In the Bible of the early church, Job will rise from the dead. Job can be seen as a type of Christ in this sense, a blameless person who suffers at God's will, but then is rewarded, and in this case, will even rise from the dead. But for as much as Job had, the healing was only a foretaste of what we should really be looking forward to in Christ. And the rest of the rest of the story is that Job will rise from the dead, and we know that we will too, because Jesus did. And like the boy with the flashlight, all of these things are really just a shadow of what is to come in Christ. And this is why we never give up. Though our bodies are dying, our spirits are being renewed every day. For our present troubles are small and won't last very long. Yet they produce for us a glory that vastly outweighs them and will last forever. So we don't look at the troubles we can see now. Rather, we fix our gaze on the things that cannot be seen. For the things we see now will soon be gone. But the things we cannot see will last forever. Amen. Thank you.